Welcome to the final plenary. My name's Tim Evans. I'm the Senior Director of Health, Nutrition, and Population at the World Bank Group. Uh, congratulations to everyone. You've survived. You've made it to the final plenary. But the work is not over. It's just beginning. Uh, this is Future Scenarios, Health Systems Development and Research Beyond the MDGs. MDGs, everybody knows what they are? All right, okay, How, who knows what the SDGs are? Okay, so I'm gonna ask one of you to define in five or less what the SDGs are. Quick. The future we want, very good, very good. All right, uh, as of the finish of the Open Working Group, uh, 17 goals, and 169 indicators. Easy, right? Simple, right? And the health goal is goal number what? Three. I heard nine somewhere. Okay, it's health goal is goal number three. But unlike the MDGs, where we had multiple health goals, in the SDGs, those of us who are health advocates, and I think there are a few in this room, we only have one goal, and so we're working in a much broader development environment, and this SDG framework is inclusive not only of low and middle income countries, but of the whole world, okay? So that is the future scenario, health systems development and research beyond the MDGs, and we have a fantastic panel assembled here. I'm going to start on the... Uh, my far right, uh, your far left, um, uh, we have Keith Clute, he's a medical doctor um, and has been chief director of the Metro District Health Services, Western Cape Government, since 2007. Seated beside Keith is Anne Musava, she's a representative of the Emerging Voices Group 2014. <laughs> <laughs> although, although, Anne, I don't see your characteristic red shirt, um, although I'm sure you've got one. Um, but Anne is a, a medical doctor and public health professional working for an NGO called Population Services Kenya. And then seated next to Anne is Sharmila Mahatri, and she heads the Governance for Equity in Health Systems Program and the Global Health Research Initiative at the International Development Research Center in Ottawa, Canada. And then there's a gap. Uh, that will be my seat if I'm allowed to sit down. Uh, and then we have Amit Sengupta. Uh, he's a physician based in New Delhi, India, and he's an associate global coordinator of the People's Health Movement. And then moving to Amit's left is Sarah Bennett, She's an associate director of the Health Systems Program and associate professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, United States. And Sarah, in addition to sitting here, will also be chairing the official closing of the symposium. And then at, next to Sarah is Abdul Ghaffar. He's the executive director of the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research at WHO. So these six individuals are going to start the session off. They're going to give you three power-packed, not PowerPoint, <laughs> power-packed sets of comments to really stimulate you to think about these future scenarios. And so uh, these are not to let you sort of sit back idly and and contemplate your flights home or your next, uh, your next steps. These are really to provoke you into thinking. And once they're finished, uh, we're gonna want to hear from you. You have scraps of paper, you have uh, little cards. Uh, put your issues, questions, challenges, recommendations uh, to the runners who will be going up and down the aisles. They will filter these back uh, to me, and we'll try and get these into the discourse as much as possible before we leave here at 9 p.m. tonight. 
<laughs> no, we, we'll do it very briefly. Um, okay, so without further ado then, uh, Keith, give us your three minutes. Thank you, Tim. Um, as a district manager and a policymaker, my take-home messages from the last three days, um, the first one, I'm giving you four messages, and I've got three challenges. The first one is, I, the take-home message for me is that the field for health systems policy analysis and research is an exciting, innovative, growing field, but very much growing. I believe district managers and policymakers are key players in shaping the field as part of this interdisciplinary common community of practice. So that's my first take-home message. The second one, um, as a district manager, stroke policymaker, I'm struck by the massive potential that can be unleashed if district managers and policymakers fully appreciate the power of being shaped by a people-centered health system and how they shape a people-health-centered system. So that's my second message. The third one, the need for coherent strategy for capacity development of healthcare workers, managers, and policymakers to become effective system practitioners and systems researchers through a continuum of capacity building strategies from an introduction to systems thinking and policy analysis all the way through to a, doc a doctoral level of health leadership training. The fourth message, the need to generate original people-centered health system experience that is context specific, but developing a common language, and that's one of the things I found out in the three days, there's no common language, <laughs> that makes the learnings transferable to other contexts, which from my perspective should be the essence of people-centered health systems research. So the three challenges um, is how to grow this network of interdisciplinary community of practice. I was in a couple of sessions and I found it interesting that because there's probably few policymakers and district managers, that a lot of the reflections was to cast the district manager and the policymakers in a very caricatured way. Um, we like the proverbial villain, um, if you follow some of the old Hollywood style movies. But really to understand when you talk about other people that needs to come into, whether you truly understand the perspectives of the other part of that. And a very interesting session this morning where uh, we had to choose how to do interdisciplinary capacity building. And there was a challenge of having somebody observe all the players, and nobody chose that challenge. So that's the growing this interdisciplinary community of service, the first, practice, first challenge. The second one is the investment in a continuum of capacity development initiatives. Again, I think um, the initiatives, and one of the key challenges that came out of this capacity in, uh, development initiatives for me was this issue about whether we are free to share and that we all buy into what that capacity development means, what the resources are required, and how we're going to do it. There were some interesting um, initiatives which talked about open, open and putting all the resources um, for everybody's use. The last challenge, I think, is the more difficult one, and that's developing a common language to make the system's learnings transferable across, across context. And I guess that's the key challenge for an emerging field where there's multiple perspectives, um, but because there's multiple perspectives, maybe the church and the parameters are too big and not clearly shaped enough um, if this is going to be a growing field going forward. Thanks, Tim. Wow. <laughs> Keith, you've set the bar very, very high. Um, great reflections and three very clear challenges, interdisciplinary networks and communities, uh, communities of practice, uh, building capacity uh, more systematically and finding that common language which really is unifying and allows us to get uh, to share across context. Fantastic, okay. So uh, Anne, are you ready? Yes. Off you go. Do you want to stand? Yeah, I think okay, I'll why don't you do that? To stand. Good. In the 2012 symposium, the emerging voices were given three slots in the closing plenary. So we were really disappointed this year when we heard that we could only have one emerging voice on stage. 
But being emerging voices, we agreed that I, the only pregnant emerging voice, would represent <laughs> the other EVs. And so we could get two people on the stage for the price of one. <laughs> So anyhow, let's do a realist evaluation of this 2014 symposium. I think you'll all agree with me that this symposium has seen an outburst of intellectual energy. And for us as emerging voices, it has been exciting to mix with the giants and raise our voices. But as I stopped to reflect, I wondered what the impact of this symposium would be. We all seem to know exactly what needs to be done. But we all agree that there remains a lot of room for translating this evidence to policy. We have been talking about universal health coverage and the people who have died due to our weak health systems in a very sanitized manner, with hardly any sense of urgency. I dare say we need a health system social movement. Perhaps we need to borrow a leaf from the HIV community who by being vocal have built political will around their issues. We need activists in this room. We need to get the politicians here. Where are the journalists? Heck, where are the people we are talking about anyway? Where are the victims of our weak health systems? <clears throat> One of the emerging voices from Ethiopia, Bifidu, had a presentation on the exploitation that Ethiopian migrant workers face, and particularly those migrating to Arab countries. And in his audience was Amal from Egypt, a 2010 emerging voice. And they got discussing, trying to identify solutions within their reach, solutions within their spheres of influence. And they came up with a solution just between the two of them. And similarly, some young emerging voices have started a dollar campaign to raise funds for Ebola. And why do I highlight all this? I often feel that as health system researchers, we don't quite see ourselves as part of the system, but rather as experts, little gods, if you may, generating evidence from without and trying to push this evidence into the system. We must embed ourselves in these systems we are researching about. We must get our hands dirty and become an active part of the change we desperately need to see. We must not only see ourselves as researchers, but as advocates for social justice. As an emerging voice starting out in my career, my progression and growth will be determined by the number of articles I have published in major peer-reviewed journals. But how many of these journals are read by those who can do anything about it? How many of these papers will be read by my local health minister in Kenya? Why can't my opinion pieces in local journals and newspapers count just as much, if not more than my future publications in The Lancet? I really think we need to take a step back and evaluate the way we evaluate ourselves, and perhaps focus more on whether we are really making a difference, on whether we are making an impact. And so, what would this health system social movement look like? I think it would have the passion of Renee Lawrenson. It would have the energizer batteries that power Lucy Gilson. <laughs> Our movement would have the bottomless budget of Bill Gates. <laughs> the audacity of Sisonke, who moderated the opening plenary. Our movement would have the courage of Martin McKee, the dance moves of Tim Evans. Oh, there we are. <laughs> and the idealism and youth of the emerging voices. Yeah. And at the center, of course, would be the concerns of the very people who are not here, the victims of our health systems. Wasn't it one of us, Margaret Mead, who said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you.
So uh, Keith set the bar high, and <laughs> Anne has not only given us two for one, I think she's given us much more than two for one. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Anne. Fantastic. Now, Sharmila, that puts you on the spot. <laughs> I, think I wouldn't want to be in your situation at the moment, but I, I know you'll rise to the occasion. Sharmila, give us your, your, your thoughts. Well, Keith said that there was not a common language, and I think in this panel there is a uh, misunderstanding of the directions. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much for inviting me to sit on the final session. And I think... I Can everybody hear Sharmila? Okay. And I'm really glad to hear, be here because I think without a doubt this is one of the best symposiums in health because health systems unite our differences. I do want to take a minute to say a hearty congratulations to the organizers, from the details of who did the bags to the actual debates that got sparked and the actions that I hope I'm going to be seeing. IDRC is honored to be a supporter of the symposium from birth and has had the privilege over the last decade to support health systems research in low and middle income countries. The organizers have asked me to speak from the perspective of, quote, funders of health systems research. And I just want to highlight some of the messages that I heard from you. Professor, Professor Tendike began by articulating that we need health systems to be democratic, social, inclusive, and contributes to development. At the same time, Prof. Irene reminded us of a Nigerian proverb, that a goat that belongs to the whole village belongs to nobody. And this is how health system can be described, but we must not let it go that way. So as a funder, I ask myself, will I stick to, as one panelist said, the politics of the achievable? No, as it would not do justice to the energy, the excellence, and the commitment that I've witnessed this last week. And more importantly, it will not do justice to the people who have no access to health or have a voice. So what I'd like to do is organize what I've heard into the not-to-dos, the must-dos, and the how. The first not-to-do. Renee Lowenson reminded us that by simply putting people in the middle does not make it a people-centered health system. So what must we do? In terms of how we do people-centered health systems research, the knowledge that matters is a knowledge that facilitates change, as we were reminded by Kumanen. As Nancy Edwards suggested, we must move from gold standards to the platinum standards of methods. So in practice, it means, and I'm going to quote several people, three things. One, where people's knowledge and role in the production, the analysis, the interpretation is the critical driver of people-centered health system. People are in control, and the researcher are the facilitators of the process. Second, making data work for people rather than people work for data. In one of the sessions, someone spoke about, quote, chasing data to fit with multiple donors' agenda. So it's important to incorporate multiple types of evidence in multiple ways and practices. Third, while strengthening capacities are key, we cannot assume that none exist, and we must recognize that capacity strengthening goes beyond training to actually shifting power. The second area of not to do. Gita Sen reminded us that we cannot confuse people-centered with PC, political correctness. We must break divides and come together. Let not race, gender, class, caste, language divide us. This was illustrated eloquently, despite the English language barrier, by Lina Rosa Paloma, a Mexican researcher, as she explained how international guidelines do not always recognize the cultural diversity of her country. So if accountability is brought in by people, as Khauser Khan eloquently relayed to us, then we must, as we facilitate, mobilize, fund, engage, and catalyze people-centered health systems, reduce ethnic and racial divide. It, not, it cannot be us and them, as Martin McKee reminded us. 
And at the conference, I saw, reflected in the program, the silos were becoming, starting to be reduced as symptom sessions started to integrate with diseases. And we discussed bringing social movements with think tanks. Inclusion and integration are key, as after all, as Lucy Gilson started us off with, the challenge that we must squarely address governance issues. And throughout the conference, there was a double-edged sword of Ebola. This has served this community with a deep and significant challenge. Not always can funders stand proud, caught between many masters. But people in this room have made IDRC proud. In terms of Ebola, in the course of this symposium, donors came together with different stakeholders to take on the challenges that Ebola has presented us with USAID and the World Bank calling a number of meetings throughout the symposium, WHO and UNICEF in the field, and the European funders well on their way with initiatives that address both basic science and health systems. And clearly, the West African Health Organization is demonstrating commitment to work with all of us to address Ebola and the system failures that it has starkly uncovered. We recognize it's not enough and must do more. So from the not to do's and the must do's, the how, the wisdom of the emerging leaders is a take home lesson. First, they said, to change mindset, we, meet, we need to see the gorilla, talk about the gorilla, and deal with the gorilla in the room. Second, to make the impact, we need to take the time to stop and reflect with others that are like-minded, but also those who are not. Lastly, they told us that in all of us, we have the capacity to lead as we bridge divides and make that goat brought to us by Irene ours. So health systems, to quote Shay Ranson and Ag Gilson in this great supplement, serve people and society. Wow. <laughs> Sharmila, that was absolutely brilliant, the way that you uh, brought so much together uh, and so quickly. And just two comments quickly in response. I can guarantee you with 100% probability that this is one of the three best global symposia on health systems research ever. <laughs> The second is I am absolutely delighted that IDRC is going to be financing all these must-dos into the future, <laughs> and we look forward to that. <laughs> all right, Amit, it's your turn. Um, please. Thank you. It's been a wonderful three days, and we know some of the people at least who have put it together. So thank you very much for this symposium. And what has been particularly refreshing for many of us has been that, possibly compared even to the last two symposiums in Montreux and Beijing, that the terrain of health systems research has been opened up, you have provided an open space, uh, not restricted to the discussions, which can be restricting, on universal health coverage, thereby allowing the use of public health language, of the language of care and solidarity, of the language of equity and gender justice, rather than which, unfortunately, sometimes, discussions restricted to UHC become limited to discussions on the language of insurance. And while I say this, I'm very conscious that Tim, Tim Evans, half an hour back, was moderating a session on UHC. But one of the things that I think uh, has been a recurrent theme in this, uh, in the presentations, at least in the plenary, and which has got the maximum amount of applause, 
has been the necessity to confront power. And I think that's important. I think it's important that the global public health community and the research community is talking consistently and repeatedly of the necessity to confront power. But for that to go beyond applause in the plenaries, to be translated into praxis by the research community, I think there is a space for expanding the work of the research community on health that interrogates power in all its dimensions, names those who make cynical use of power to perpetuate inequity. It is important to confront power in the family, in communities. There's often this fairly romantic vision of a community which is very homogeneous. Communities are as fractured, as hierarchical, as the global community. So we need to confront power and we need evidence we need research which interrogates uh, this power. For the People's Health Movement, the other issue that, the other common phrase that has been quite, and surprisingly, uh, quite often used in the meetings is social movements. Again, for that to have meaning for the research communities, it has to translate into praxis of interrogating the practice of social movements, of looking at the ways in which social movements can and do bring about change. I think it was Martin McKay who, in uh, one of the plenaries, talked about social movements uh, needing to bring out shadow reports. I would go a step forward. I would say these are the reports, and social movements do bring out reports. Uh, we have the Global Health Watch, which the PHM brings out, but there are lots of others. Many of them were released here. Those are the reports which need to be ma mainstreamed. Perhaps they are the mirror of truth. Perhaps more than the glossier versions uh, brought out by those who conventionally are seen as the repository of wisdom today. So we need, in future conferences, much more of truth spoken about and by social movements and also by the research community. And finally, as uh, all the speakers earlier have said, and I think it needs to be said again, this conference is being organized in the shadow of the Ebola epidemic. It is an epidemic that should not have happened. Because even in epidemiological terms, the Ebola virus should not cause an epidemic. The fact that we have an epidemic where there shouldn't be any is a collective failure. It is the collective failure of the public health community. It is a collective failure of the research community that we have been unable to harness the evidence, to harness resources, to harness, Ill, uh, harness the will to build public systems. And I would like to end by saying that if we are to walk the talk regarding the Ebola epidemic, two years is a long time. It's a long time which, would, which can allow you, us to erase the memories of what should not have happened. But if we are to walk the talk, then the least that we can do is take the lesson of Ebola into the research community in terms of understanding why we did not build public systems. We continue not to build public systems, not just in West Africa, but across the world. The need to build, and I'm conscious when I use the word public and not government, public systems owned by the public, accountable to the public, conceived by the public. I think this is a huge area of research that we owe 
uh, to the global community uh, that this, we take up this research. And finally, just one last line. Can we walk the talk? Uh, perhaps in a symbolic manner, but symbolic issues matter. By, in future symposia, renaming what we call the marketplace here as the solidarity space. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for, for really sort of opening things up and also uh, suggesting that uh, we need to really walk the talk. We have an accountability, I think, you're, you're pr pr pushing us towards with respect to Ebola. What's our response going to look like two years from now? And how much have we learned and incorporated messages on that front? And I think your praxis message, which is very much in line with, uh, with other great works on pedagogy of the oppressed, et cetera, is an important reminder of, uh, of what people-centered systems uh, need to be uh, primarily concerned about. So thank you. Very good. Sarah, on to you. We look forward to an academic's perspective. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I'm actually struck by how much what I wanted to say overlaps with many of the prior speakers. And I'm going to say it again, because I might say it differently, but also maybe it's good to recognize that there's some confirmation and agreement between what's really struck people about this symposium. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that. Was the mic working properly? He's asking me to reference what I say. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so first of all, I have not seen the same le level of energy and enthusiasm at any of the other big international meetings that I've been to compared to this one. And that's been wonderful. It's been like a flowering of a community who are just happy to see each other and happy to exchange and debate ideas. Um, and I also think that the emerging voices and the emerging leaders have enriched our community hugely. You've brought an energy and a spirit that we really needed. So I'm extremely grateful for that. And I'm hoping that that, that pipeline of emerging voices will continue to grow and develop because I think that um, any community... Any, new, any community needs to be renewed and kept alive, and at that, this point, you're doing a wonderful job for us, so thank you very much. When we were trying to figure out how, what theme to choose for this, uh, this meeting, and it's a real struggle trying to figure out what's the right theme, how do you frame it, how do you, how do you pull it together, one of the things that was driving us was that the previous um, symposia had had a theme around universal health coverage. And while we all recognized that that was absolutely central and really important to our community, we also felt that some of the conversations had been more dominated on the financing side. And we thought that there was a real need and urgency to think more about what happens on the service delivery side. And actually, this symposium has confirmed, in my view, that that, that assessment was correct. I think that our language and our notion of what needs to be done on the financing side is better aligned than what, what we think we need to do on the, on the service delivery side. I think we have a lot of work to do around strengthening service delivery. But that service delivery side is further, um, there's a bigger challenge because I think the environment is changing so fast. And um, I mentioned uh, elsewhere that um, there's big uh, epidemiological changes, demographic changes, and I think also changes in ICT that are really transforming what we are able to do in terms of service delivery. And my sense is that 20 or 30 years from now, um, health systems and the services that they deliver may be organized very differently to um, where we are at this point. But I think that this um, imperative to change um, service delivery structures also opens up a much bigger space for us in terms of thinking about voice, transparency, accountability. My sense is that service delivery is really going to revolve much more and center much more around communities in the future. And I think that as that shift takes place, we're also going to need to think about how do we make parallel changes in the governance and accountability agenda. I think that those two need to and hopefully will go hand in hand. So I wanted to finish um, by reflecting a little bit more about the sort of research that we need to do and, 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 the, and the methods. And um, 
actually, Amit used the phrase that I was also thinking of using about opening up space, opening up space for dialogue. And I have been um, really pleased how this symposium has opened up space in a number of different um, respects. First of all, I think that the type of research methods that we've discussed here have been different to or have expanded upon the kind of research methods that we typically talk about at um, research meetings. So I think Kuminen tweeted at one point a diffs and diffs analysis on a, on a slide, and he was saying for all of those who are desperately missing this kind of quantitative analysis, here's proof that it does exist here. So it was here, but we also had people talking about participatory action research, methods such as photo voice, the ideas of crowdsourcing data, and, and a lot more talk about implementation research, moving us to think not just about how do we design changes in health systems, but how do we implement those changes in ways that um, are, are informed and continue to learn from the evidence as it becomes available. And so I'm really welcoming um, that broadening of space around the kind of methods that health systems reach researchers can and should be using. The second way in which I saw a sort of broadening of space for dialogue was around um, the actors involved. And I guess a sort of reflection is that um, sometimes the debates within our community, historically, and I hope it will be different going forward, are sometimes a little bit top down. You know, there's a vision, there's a global mission that we've all bought into, and it's looking, talking very much between researchers and policy makers. But I think that this theme and the way that this symposium was structured has really allowed um, a diversity of actors, more civil society people, more um, voices from providers who are closer to the field or who are actually providing health services. I don't think we've gone far enough in that direction, um, but I would like to at least acknowledge that there has been something of a shift. And my sense of the temperature amongst the community and the participants here is that actually um, that's something that we could push further, particularly if we're really serious about our commitments to uh, furthering implementation research and making our work more participatory. Finally, the third dimension in which I think there has been um, an expanding of space, an expanding of space for dialogue, has been around um, cross-boundary co collaboration. And I've been a little bit puzzled as to why this um, theme of sort of uh, collaboration across boundaries has, has come up more here than previously. I think there are perhaps a, a number of reasons. I think, you know, firstly, some of the um, plenary sessions that we had were much more explicitly political in their nature than the nature of plenaries at many of these kind of big global meetings. And I think that that was very provocative and made us think about how does politics fit within the kind of research that we do? What kind of role does it have? But it also opened up discussion to other disciplines that may be less well respected uh, or re less well reflected, not respected necessarily, within our community. Um, so I've had conversations about you know, the need to bring in ethicists to help us think through health systems challenges, the need to draw more on legal experts. And I think that that kind of broadening of the disciplines is important. Um, but perhaps also the theme pointed to, our, to the importance of intersectoral uh, collaboration as well. I think when we talk about people-centered health systems, we need to think more broadly about how do the other sectors that are important to meet people's needs work with the health system more, more effectively. So there are a number of ways in which this notion of us being able to strengthen our skills and more effectively work across boundaries that have typically divided us, I think is a very important one, and one that I hope that we can step up to uh, going forward. Thank you. Great. So Sarah, you've lived up to your billing as a true academic. You've, you've parsed the issues brilliantly and given us sort of three very good uh, uh, compass points for moving forward, which I think are hallmarks of, of what this symposium is adding uh, to the movement. Thank you very much. And now we finish with Gafar. Last but not least, you're going to give us the perspective from uh, an alliance, a, a multinational alliance. Thank you, Tim. I, I think I would just add my words of like appreciation to the organizers. But I think as Sarah was saying, we have evolved over the last like few years from Montreux to Beijing to here, not only like in quality of the presentation, but also thinking and the discussion. It has become more 
related to politics, public policy, transdisciplinary involvement of the people, and there's more openness and willingness within the, like, the presenters that they're happy to talk it. And so I will have like few points. One of the, I think still one of the issues we are, like the impression I have heard and I have seen that most of the presentations still are focusing on the health services than on health system. So it's the health services delivery system around that and there had not been many presentation about accountability, governance, effective leadership. And Ebola is a perfect example of like lack of effective leadership because why those leaders in those countries has not th thought through it to establish the good health systems. And I think we need to understand and appreciate that we have, if we really want to call ourselves health system researchers, I, I'm not a big fan of like six building blocks, but I think health goes beyond Ministry of Health even. As you are saying, like Sarah was saying, the NCDs, the health promotion, health prevention, there's a lot of things which are not necessarily under the domain of the health ministries of health, and the way that usually the minister, uh, ministries of health and the health systems has been designed. So I think we need to think about that and we need to move forward and apply the systems lens of the system thinking whenever we are commissioning, conducting, or supporting systems research. But that will require a very different sort of like training in the schools of public health, and that is transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary thing. And I think that, that that's one of the issues is like, we are all agreeing through that, and I think in the last session, Peter Berman stood up and he said, where's the method? And I think that that's like sort of a still, we keep on defending ourselves and we say, okay, what is the gold standard? We, we hear, where's the rigor? And I think we have to come out of that fear that this is a weak science when we talk to our colleagues who only believe in the RCTs and that's the gold standard for them. We just have to tell them this is a different science and it has its own discipline, it has its own methodology, it has its own like, way of conducting and doing it. But I think we need to go and we need to defend it, but we need to develop also the methods and the framework which we can teach and train and use. And I think the other, one important thing which also comes is like incentives in the schools of public health. So primarily what Anne was saying is, look, all peer-reviewed publications, that's the incentives, number of publications and bringing the money or the grants. That's good for the school, that's good for that faculty staff for promotion or recognition. But we seriously have to think if we're really trying to help the policy makers, decision makers, implementers, how many of them read these peer-reviewed publications? Is this the best mechanism or the medium to disseminate it? Or is there an alternate way of doing that? And that we should say, because as a student of science, I understand the peer review is a system which is very transparent, which is very neutral, and which is we are accountable to those. But is it the only way that things have changed? And I think we, this is a challenge for the whole health system research community and the policy research community that we need to develop different mechanisms to do research, but also different incentives within the schools of public health so that young researchers or the old researcher or the old, everybody can do the things very differently. So another thing which I have, like, I have observed, it was what has come out of this discussion is the need to engage with the implementers. I think Keith started with, with this thing. And I think the issue is still there's a serious trust deficit between the researchers and policy and the decision makers. And most of us who are trained in the schools of medicine and the schools of public health, we are not trained to engage with policy and the decision makers. And we always suspect them, they always suspect us. And if we really want to engage with them, we need to learn those skills and we, we need to trust them. And we have to like talk to them and we, while we are setting a research agenda, research priority, we sit either in DC or in Geneva or in London and we say this is a global research agenda. And we do some priority setting exercises but those are done primarily managed and run by the researchers from the few selected institutions, and then we say, okay, would you like to commission this research? Would you like to give us some money? Obviously the answer is no, we are, we are not interested in that money and that research. And then I think also the context is very, very important. The, like, 
even within like a country that the, the setting is very different. If one thing is very much applicable, let's say in India, in the UP, it's not equally effective in Maharashtra or Karnataka or Punjab even. So we have to see what sort of capacity strengthening movement we have to do. And other is like uh, we all like to get money from the fund. I would like to make a strong plea to the funders that if we really want to strengthen the capacity, it's a long-term investment. It's not a one grant. It's not a two years grant. It's not a three years grant. And especially if we want to have the mentorship program like these young researchers, if they want to engage with some senior mentor, mm -hmm. the mentorship has become in the end sort of a, like a very, you have to have the same like thinking, philosophy, movement, whatever you want to, you want to be part of that movement, but somebody has to keep on supporting because most of the national government are still not at that level that they're going to, but funders say, okay, two years grant, tell us how much capacity strength to say, what is the impact? I don't think there's any impact, but I think that is another area where we need to engage with the program managers, policy makers, <coughs> implementers, and the decision makers. And when we say we don't have to all, so there's a like suspicion, we always think policy makers are director general, secretaries of health, or the ministers. To me, everybody that is in the district health officer is the most important person in any like national health systems. And we don't, we think they are just like pure managers. And management is another skill which I think in the schools of public health is completely ignored and people think it's a common sense. But I think even if you have improved your management practices at the district level, at the state level, there would be huge gain into the health outcomes. But because that does not come primarily in the health services or the health, like healthcare delivery system, which is, we like to see the outputs of the reduction in the mortality. But I think if there's a serious design, good design, we can significantly show a progress if we improve our like management practices. And I think finally, I just want to have like one last thing, which is ethics of health system research. And I think we struggle when we present our like cases to the IRBs or the National Ethics Review Committees. They try to treat them as biomedical research, clinical trials, and the issue is genuine, like when we want to do some sort of health system research intervention, there's a very like sort of a blurred line between the practice and the research. And sometimes they say, okay, it's practice, so we don't need like, it's like you're changing the incentive, you're trying to distribute differently the nurses or the doctors. Why do you need any ethical approval? But I think that's a methodological challenge. We, as a community in the health system research, we need to work, I understand there's a, thematic working group on the health system ethics, but I think this is the, an area where could be some set of issues under conflict. So as a community, we need to be very clear and devise some guidance, if not the guidelines, so that the young researchers at the district level, at the program level, are not going to make any mistakes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gafar. Um, now Gafar was, being far too humble in terms of, and discreet with respect to the agenda of the Alliance for Health Systems and Policy Research. Um, he, he was really saying that uh, the new agenda is all about long-term capacity building, um, and therefore the funders of the Alliance are going to support the Alliance in the long term uh, for that capacity building. Uh, he was also um, giving us all reason to feel that the Alliance is our alliance. He's going to change the criteria for promotion uh, for those of us who have never, uh, uh, you know, published an article. Uh, and so I look forward to those career uh, criteria that are not based on peer review publications where I have struck out uh, more times than I wish to. Uh, acknowledge. And finally, um, it, you've, you've acknowledged a move of the alliance of, uh, uh, from WHO to, I think, UNDP. Uh, and we look forward to that. So you're really going to walk the talk on, on getting intersectoral. Okay, so you've heard it. Um, we've had um, uh, a, a, a veritable uh, director of health services in, in, in a sub-region of South Africa. We've got an emerging voice or voices. Uh, uh, we have a, 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 an official funder of, uh, of research, 
a, a, a veritable voice from civil society, a true academic, uh, and uh, somebody who's a leading alliance for health uh, policy and systems research. A spectrum of great issues. Um, how well have they reflected uh, what is on your minds? Okay, so here's the opportunity now, and I think there may be a few uh, issues coming up. And if any of you get impatient, you should rise from your seats and start shouting. Okay, so I'm going to take um, and ask, given that we have to um, um, uh, draw this session, this part of the session to a close, I'm, I'm going to choose one that uh, uh, really relates to at least the title of the session with respect to, to looking forward uh, beyond the MDGs. Um, and uh, the other uh, comments and questions here are noted, and I've had uh, a guarantee from the Secretariat that they will all be captured in some uh, accessible form. Uh, and so to acknowledge our, our gratefulness to everybody for, for their participation. But this um, uh, question is, um, the Open Working Group uh, of the UN draft uh, contains one health goal uh, of 17 SDGs. What are the implications for health systems research? Okay, so I'm going to give each of our panelists um, an opportunity to answer that, um, but your constraint is that you have no more than 60 seconds um, or else uh, we'll really get in trouble. Uh, so, um, Keith, do you want to lead off? <laughs> um, 60 seconds. Um, yeah. I'm, SDGs, 17, <laughs> one for health. Why does yeah. that make us think differently about health systems research? Yep. Um, I think the, the, the focus on people-centered people health systems um, poses a very important challenge um, for the post-15 agenda. Um, I think there was a question about whether you talk about health services, whether you talk about health systems and how universal it is and it cuts across others. So from my perspective, um, I think we've not achieved well on MDGs and the four, five, and six that's related to us. Um, I think the post-15 agenda should actually cut across many of the, many of the upstream factors that impacts on health systems. Um, and I think there's a big area of discussion that needs to unfold, which I can't do in 60 seconds. <laughs> great, great, thank you. And? Um, while previous MDGs were really fragmented across different uh, disease control areas, I think having just one health goal gives us a real opportunity to push across our health systems social movement as an overarching um, agenda over all, all the other uh, disease control areas. So I see it really as an opportunity for us in health systems. Fantastic. Thank you. Sharmila. I think it, the implication for us is that it actually shows the beauty of health systems that despite the fact they were one out of 17 on a, on a global level, where the rubber hits a row where health matters, we still need to do work. And unfortunately, we're not gonna go out of business. And I think as Anne was saying, we just focus and get the work done. All right, you said fortunately, we're not gonna go out of business. Is that what you said? Unfortunately. Okay, Ahmed? <laughs> well, frankly, I wouldn't see that this as a competitive issue, which unfortunately at times we get into, that why only one health goal out of 17, can we have three more? Uh, it's one planet, and hopefully we will be starting to act as one people. Uh, so that's one part of it. The other is, it also depends on how you look at health. I would, for example, uh, look at health as all that we do in society is health. If you do it right, you get good health. So in that sense, I would say the research community is not restricted only to looking at health systems. It's, it has the opportunity to look at the effect of employment on health, on education for health, etc. So health is much broader than just health care. And so the opportunities are immense, irrespective of whether we have one designated uh, health goal in the SDGs. Great, thank you. Sarah. 
I would agree with Anne. I think finally we're recognizing that one person may be a pregnant mother with HIV and maybe another infectious disease. And hopefully this will allow us to make sure that uh, health systems are better designed to meet the needs of that pregnant mother. Great. Gafar. I, I think I see it very positively because it gives us a scope, broader scope, which is focusing on the health system because my understanding would be on the health and well-being. So it will give us more opportunity to conduct commission and support policy and systems research. Great, great. So I, I think what I would editorialize on the basis of that, um, those comments is that uh, we will be fortunate uh, to be in business. Um, I think we've got to ramp up the knowledge. It relates to not only the complexity of the number of targets that are currently within goal three, uh, the health goal, but it does relate to this uh, imperative to understand the uh, necessity of engaging those other sectors which will have goals um, because we know that they're, they're co-complements um, and, and co-requisites for achieving uh, what we want to achieve in health. Um, let me just finish with a few reflections because I, I, I want to acknowledge that I think uh, um, this has just been a fantastic panel, so I'd like to be <laughs> off. And I think that uh, by, put, by putting people-centered uh, uh, in very upfront in the, uh, as the theme of this meeting, uh, I think what we've really sa are, are saying is that uh, values need to drive health systems. And I know that's a big umbrella, but I, I think in all of the descriptions of people-centeredness, uh, what comes back are these core values of equity and fairness and justice, which are really those fundamental values that we think and should, and we should not be apologetic about, as what really shape and drive systems and drive the knowledge uh, for health systems. But we know that values are not sufficient. They're a necessary prerequisite. And in order to move forward, we do need a common language, and uh, we do need rigor, and we also need hybrid vigor, because the methods and the ways in which we can learn in complex systems are, are not going to come uh, necessarily from one altar of research orthodoxy, uh, but perhaps uh, from various traditions and understandings and uh, methods that allow to get at uh, truth and knowledge as it, uh, at, as it emerges in different contexts. I also think that this symposium has put a much stronger emphasis on policy. And we've talked about it as politics and power, but policy is that venue. And it isn't simply the top policymakers, it's decisions that relate to how um, systems change on a daily basis to the big reforms in the last session that we we're looking at, which often characterize five-year plans and things like that. And I also think that what we've heard in people-centeredness is participation. And here it isn't uh, the uh, siloed academics who uh, can be the gods of knowledge, uh, uh, as we heard, but uh, rather that it is an, uh, a shared agenda uh, because the systems and policy research agenda is contingent on bringing context and knowledge together and walking forward hand in hand. Uh, I think we have to remember that it can't go forward without adequate financing. And this field is growing, <coughs> but in order for it to grow faster, uh, we need to remember that the way in which research is funded uh, doesn't put us out ahead of other competitors. And I think that we always have to continue to pay attention to one of the least popular areas of policy, which is research policy, and work to develop institutions that really reflect and support and nurture this movement much more systematically as we move forward. And that's part of my last point, making sure that we build the capacity um, that is necessary, both in the formal full-time sense, but also the part-time sense, that 
uh, that we heard from a, a, a leader of a district uh, in, in this country that uh, your ability to undertake and be part of active uh, learning to solve problems through health systems research discipline is as important as what Sarah might be publishing in health policy planning or uh, The Lancet, and we need to value that capacity uh, fundamentally. I will make one final editorial remark because, as many have said, we're, 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 we've had this meeting in a in, in almost a, a surrealistic context, and, and particularly for those that have been engaged and are directly concerned with respect to the Ebola uh, emergency, um, one feels a little bit guilty, perhaps, of removing oneself from that reality and context um, at such a critical time, and I know I've heard that expressed time and time again, indirectly and informally in corridor discussions, but also through some of the spontaneous sessions that have emerged here. But I do think that there's some very serious lessons for us, and I hope we can meet Amit's throwing down of the gauntlet. Um, and it relates to understanding where the knowledge agenda is in the context of acute emergencies. Health systems research isn't just about the grand plan and thinking about a panacea for the future and long term to get there. Um, every day we have to make really tough and important decisions to act. And a crisis like Ebola um, magnifies that imperative. And I think how we bring knowledge and competency to that is absolutely fundamental. And I would argue that it, it isn't simply a function of lack of competencies on the national level. Uh, I think we've seen a flagrant display of lack of competencies on the global level. And I hope that we can think about the global health system response as a critical complement to national health systems when we come back in two years and look perhaps at how we can be bringing knowledge and evidence to bear more fundamentally so that our response to emergencies uh, can be much more successful and prevent uh, the unnecessary suffering that I think so many of us are concerned about. So with that, thank you very much.